Okay. Well, let's just, well, let's, this hearing will come to order, and good afternoon, and I want to welcome everyone to today's hearing on and to discussion with domestic and international research governance of geoengineering. And let me give a little preface, uh, particularly to our, our guest, uh, Chairman Willis. Uh, we are going to be having votes around our time, 12.30 or 1. Uh, you know what that is like when the bells go off. Uh, so it is our hope to, um, to move forward uh, with your uh, first part of this hearing. Um, and as we go along, we'll have a little better uh, understanding. Um, our changing climate has been the topic of sometimes heated discussion uh, at some of our committee's hearings. It is understandable, as with any field of science, climate service or climate science will continue to evolve over time to provide a ever greater level of accuracy for findings and forecast. However, in my opinion, one thing is now clear. The overwhelming preponderance of data indicates that global climate is changing, that humans are at least partially responsible, and that we can best mitigate the damage by reducing our emissions of greenhouse gases such as carbon dioxide. Additionally, I'm concerned that the impacts of climate change could outpace the world's political, economic, and physical ability to avoid them through greenhouse gas reductions alone. Therefore, we must know what other tools we have at our disposal. If certain proposals for deliberate modification of the climate, otherwise known as geoengineering, represent an, one option. Uh, but we cannot know until we have done the research on the full range of impacts of global engineering. We will... Um, it will take substantial time and research uh, to determine whether these new technologies uh, can develop approaches, uh, whether there is a uh, appropriate gov uh, governance um, structures, and to test them to see what potential benefits and hazards uh, may be posed. As the chairman of the uh, committee on um, jurisdiction, my interest is to provide a forum for open and honest discussion of geoengineering just as we will have on nuclear uh, power, on carbon capture and sequestration, other energy sources, as well as other types of mitigation. And today we are here to discuss the matters of domestic and international governance of geoengineering research programs. With that, I'd like to, to thank our excellent witness, uh, Chairman uh, Willis, for appearing before this committee. And I yield to the distinguished ranking chairman, Mr. Hall, for his opening uh, remarks. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And But for my respect for you, I'd have a lot longer opening remark here. But I'd just say that I believe this is the third hearing our committee has held on geoengineering. And as I've expressed on previous occasions, I have significant reservations about pursuing this line of research. With that, in the interest of time and courtesy to our very distinguished guest, I'll just put this in the record. You can read it later if you like to. Without objection, thank you, uh, Mr. Hall. And now uh, it's my pleasure to introduce our witness at this time. Um, Member of Parliament, uh, Phil Willis, is the chairman of the United Kingdom's House of Commons Science and Technology Committee. Chairman Willis has represented the constituency of Harrogate and Knaresborough in the Parliament since 1997. Before his election to the House of Commons, Chairman Willis served as a distinguished educator at, in the UK schools for over 35 years, 20 of those years as head teacher at a large comprehensive school. During his tenure in Parliament, Chairman Willis has been a champion for inclusive childhood education, vocational training, and affordable university tuition. I'm honored to have uh, embraced upon or embarked upon this joint activities with your committee during each of our last terms. We thank you for your commitment to this inquiry and appearing before us today. And let me remind everyone here today, this is a very uh, historic and unique hearing that we're having. Uh, to the best of my knowledge, it's the first time that two uh, committees, similar committees, uh, in this case the Science and Technology Committee within Congress and the U.K. have agreed to have a joint hearing, uh, or I guess I should say parallel hearings, uh, on a topic of which that there will be brought back uh, information, not uh, as a legislative proposal, but rather as a potential recommendation. So, uh, again, this is his, his, historic, and Chairman Willis, I appreciate uh, you being a part of this. Your written testimony will be included in the record, and now uh, we welcome you to begin your oral testimony. Deserved uh, glorious introduction that I had given you earlier, uh, as well as the um, statement as to the uniqueness and historic aspect 
of uh, this uh, hearing. Uh, there's another historic matter going on right now, and that is a health care debate in Congress. Uh, our phone lines are being jammed. We had 40,000 yesterday, so it's making all uh, communication difficult. But as was pointed out earlier, if we can get to the moon, we should be able to complete this hearing. And so with that, uh, I welcome you to begin. Well, first of all, thank you very much indeed, uh, Senator Gordon. And uh, I, was, I, I was making the, uh, the comment that um, if, in fact, we can't get this to work, then geoengineering is a long way off, uh, uh, off the agenda. But may I commence by saying how honored I am to appear before the U.S. House of Representatives Science and Technology Select Committee. Uh, this, as I'm probably I'm sure you said um, uh, in, in Washington, uh, is the first for our committees. And I trust that the level of cooperation between our committees can be continued after our general election, which occurs in probably May of this year. This inquiry really began life in April 2009, when we visited Washington, D.C., and uh, met with um, your chairman, Bart Gordon, and we discussed then the possibility of a joint inquiry. My fellow committee members and I are delighted uh, that we have managed, um, within the constraints of procedure, to undertake something that approached a joint inquiry. My state for the record that our staff have found your staff to be absolutely superb to work with, highly professional, exceedingly helpful, uh, and knowledgeable. And we as a committee have thoroughly enjoyed the process of dovetailing our inquiry on, in, on geoengineering specifically to fit into your larger inquiry into the wider issues of geoengineering. I very much hope that this relationship between our two committees is something that can outlast mine um, and indeed your tenure. Today we published um, in London our report, The Regulation of Geoengineering, and geoengineering is a topic that, as a committee, we have been interested in for a while. We were, I believe, the very first legislature uh, to examine geoengineering, which we did as part of a larger report on engineering itself. And in that report, we urged the UK government to consider the full range of policy options for managing climate change. And that includes various geoengineering options as potential Plan B in the event that Plan A, mitigation and adaption, <clears throat> was not sufficient. We divided geoengineering into technologies that reduce uh, solar insulation, um, SDM or SRM as I think you call it, um, that is to keep the earth cooler by reflecting more of the sun's energy, and carbon sequestration, uh, that is taking carbon out of the atmosphere to reduce the greenhouse effect. We cautioned against mass rollout without extensive research and suggested that our UK research councils fund research on modelling the effects of geoengineering and to start a public debate on the use of geoengineering techniques, both of which uh, I'm pleased to say are now underway. Following that inquiry, the Royal Society produced a report on geoengineering, an excellent report that details the scientific and technological issues and options, and I believe that you took evidence from Professor uh, John Shepherd, who was chairman of the Royal Society's geoengineering panel. One of the key recommendations from the Royal Society's report was that the regulation of geoengineering uh, required careful consideration. And we decided, as part of a dovetailing exercise with your committee, to take on that challenge and move the debate on the regulation of geoengineering a little further. The first question in our terms of reference for this inquiry was, is there a need for international regulation of geoengineering research and deployment? And if so, what international regulatory mechanisms need to be deployed? We discovered two things. First, some geoengineering techniques are already subject to regulation. In fact, there's a lot of regulation in, in this field. For example, ocean f uh, uh, fertilization is being managed by the London Convention on Ocean Dumping under the London Protocol. And existing international regulatory arrangements, such as the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, 
could relatively easily incorporate some geoengineering techniques, particularly carbon dioxide removal technologies. Second, as regards the remaining techniques, such as stratospheric aerosols or space mirrors, it is not clear that existing treaties could be adequately altered to encompass them, and they would need uh, looking at afresh. Additionally, particularly for technologies such as injecting aerosols into the stratosphere, the costs are relatively low, uh, which means that a rich country might be able to engage in this kind of activity unilaterally. And the effects are not predictable and cannot be contained within national boundaries. And we should be keen, therefore, to avoid a situation where one nation deliberately or otherwise alters the climate of another nation without prior agreement. We concluded that, and I quote, the science of, of geoengineering is not sufficiently advanced to make the technology predictable, but this of itself is not grounds for refusing to develop a regulatory framework. There are good scientific reasons for allowing investigative research and better reasons for seeking to devise and implement some regulatory frameworks, particularly for those techniques that a single country or small group of countries could test or deploy and impact the whole climate. End of quote. We also concluded that there is a need to develop regulatory frameworks for geoengineering, where there are existing international regulatory regimes which need to develop a focus on geoengineering. And some regulatory systems need to be designed and implemented for those solar radiation management techniques that currently fall outside any international uh, framework. Having decided that there is a need for regulatory regimes uh, for geoengineering, we considered what principles might govern them. So a group of academics from universities at Oxford, uh, uh, University College London and Cardiff came up with a set of five principles of which we are very supportive. And these principles are, first, that geoengineering uh, should be regulated as a public good, and we need to define what public good is. Second, that public participation in geoengineering and decision making is absolutely essential. If we don't take people with us, we may well lose the argument. Third, that disclosure of geoengineering research an open publication of results is absolutely essential if we're going to take the scientific community with us and particularly we're going to take the public uh, with us. Fourthly, independent assessment of impacts. It is, it is peer review in this area is crucially important. And finally, governance before deployment. That we make sure that we have a framework before in fact there is a major deployment. Um, may I conclude with a few specifics that might be of interest to your inquiry? Following careful consideration of a wide range of views on geoengineering, we concluded the following. First, regarding research that uses computers to model the impact of geoengineering technologies, we wholeheartedly support that work so long as it adheres to principle three on the disclosure and open publication of results. We thought that even a short-term ban on solar radiation management research would be a mistake, largely because it would be unenforceable and therefore having bans would not work. Third, it seems sensible that if small-scale testing of solar radi radiation management geoengineering is going to take place, it should adhere to the full set of principles that I just outlined and there should be negligible or predictable environmental impact as far as is possible, and that there should be no transboundary effects. Uh, fourth, it would be prudent for researchers exploring the impact of geoengineering techniques to make a special effort to include international expertise, and particularly scientists from the developing world, which is most vulnerable to climate change. And finally, we concluded that, and I quote, any testing that impacts on the climate, end of quote, that is large scale enough to have a real impact on wider climate, must be subject to an international regulatory framework. May I finish uh, my comments, Mr. Chairman, by making some broader observations. We found this to be a hugely complex area. 
international agreements are not always easy for non-controversial issues. But climate change, which is a controversial issue because of the impact that mitigation efforts might have on our economies, has proven very difficult to get international agreement on, as we saw recently at Copenhagen. I cannot see how geoengineering could be any easier, but that should not be a reason to back off. If the climate warms dangerously and we can't fix the problem by reducing carbon emissions or adapting the, climate, the changing climate, geoengineering might be our only chance. It would be irresponsible of us not to get the ball rolling on regulation. And to that end, we consider that the only appropriate forum for managing something like geoengineering would be the UN. Geoengineering covers such a wide range of technologies that more than one international body would be required to work on international agreements. And we suggested that the UK government, and that is something it might be able to do in partnership with the US government, should one, press hard for a suitable international body to commission a review of how geoengineering regulation might work in practice, and two, we should press hard for the establishment of an international consortium to explore the safest and most effective geoengineering uh, options. Thank you very much indeed, Mr. Chairman. Well, thank you, Chairman Willis, for that uh uh, very good presentation, and we received your report, I think, 130 pages uh, yesterday, uh, which we're starting to uh, go through. I, I certainly uh, concur with you that geoengineering is controversial, both on the left and the right, it's, and I concur that it's something that we hope that will never take place, uh, but it would be irresponsible uh, uh, for us not to start uh, at least looking at the uh, foundation for potential research. Uh, I think any implementation w is decades out, but uh, you have to start somewhere. And so we very much appreciate your participation and, and that of your excellent staff. Now we will, at this point, move to the first round of questions, and the chair will recognize himself for five minutes. Um, as you mentioned in your testimony, uh, you felt that there would be a, an international database uh, would be a very good way to help have uh, a tool for transparency and public understanding. Uh, do you have any suggestions on how that database might be developed or how it would work? Well, uh, f first of all, uh, Mr. Chairman, um, there are no um, extensive examples of international databases. I mean, here in the United Kingdom, we have a, a, a database which uh, deals particularly with, um, with, with clinical trials and the use of clinical trials. Okay. Uh, and in fact, the World Health Organization also has a voluntary database um, on, on clinical trials. So that's a, an example. And the, the National Center for Biotechnology um, also, GenBank, which is, of course, held in the United States, um, has an excellent international global database uh, for looking particularly at uh, gene therapies and, and the like. So I think there are examples uh, uh, there. But I think really it is hugely important um, that in terms of actually creating um, a database, that that's done in terms of international co collaboration, that we include particularly third world countries as well in that, because they're the most affected by, uh, by climate change as, uh, as we know. So I think it's important to, uh, to, to first of all find somewhere where in fact we would have the repository uh, and there'd have to be international agreement uh, on that. I think secondly, we would, know to know, we would want to know what would go in the database. And we felt that there were a number of things. First of all, in terms of simply listing current research, I think it's quite possible indeed to pull together the research that's going on around the world. And as you know, Mr. Chairman, there is some extensive research going on in the United States. There is research going on in Australia, in Canada, uh, and, and elsewhere in the world. I think secondly, to ensure that we put what stage that research is at. If we're looking at particularly models, uh, from, uh, for instance, um, aerosols in stratosphere, it is important that we get that result of that midterm. We don't wait for it to be completed. I think thirdly, do we make sure that the database looks at the aims of research, that when research projects are being uh, launched, 
that it is clear what the aims are so that other scientists around the world can in fact collaborate, can work with that, can actually replicate um, ex, uh, um, experiments. And I think, fourthly, it is important that wherever research is taking place, that within the database comes, you know, the order of risk. That we know that a lot of these technologies are hugely low risk and therefore, you know, can easily be lodged in a database without, in fact, having to have huge explorations or it causing controversy. Uh, where, in fact, you're, for instance, uh, seeding the oceans, if, in fact, you're going to put aerosols uh, uh, into, in, into uh, the stratosphere, which might have an effect somewhere else, and clearly, those elements of risk, I think, have got to be assessed and put into the database. Uh, and all that would be hugely influential in actually guiding future uh, geoengineering regulation. Thank you. And uh, how do you foresee the future of geoengineering research in the United Kingdom? What direction will it go, if at all? Are national or uh, European Commission geoengineering research programs likely uh, to be a re reality? Uh, is the United Kingdom's Defense Department, are they looking at, uh, the, uh, uh, looking at geoengineering possibilities also? Well, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think what is interesting here is if, if you'd have asked me that question uh, 18 months ago, um, I would have said no, 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 and no. Uh, to, uh, to all those uh, points, because I think 18 months to two years ago, geoengineering was not on the agenda. Um, I can recall having a, a, a committee session here in the UK Parliament uh, with the minister responsible for, for climate change to ask if, in fact, there was any research being commissioned in this particular area. And the answer was no. We have Plan A, which is uh, about uh, mitigation, uh, and we don't, in fact, uh, plan to go down the road of geoengineering. Um, Eighteen months later, uh, the government has commissioned uh, research to its credit, um, and in fact the National Environment Research Council is also uh, conducting uh, research. A number of leading universities in the UK uh, are, are conducting research in terms of uh, regulation. And as I have said to you, both the Royal Society has conducted a major inquiry looking at uh, the different types of geoengineering and are about to, and in fact they've just announced, that they're going to set up a major inquiry uh, looking at the regulation of geoengineering. In Europe as well. Um, the, whilst there is nothing in the current framework program uh, in terms of research projects for geoengineering, uh, we understand that the European Research Council is in fact considering uh, bids to, uh, to actually look at particularly the modelling of geoengineering in terms of certain aspects. So this is on the rise. Um, and I think it's good that that is happening, and it's good that we're not turning our minds away from the future need which might arise to use uh, geoengineering technologies. And I agree totally with you, Mr. Chairman, uh, that this is an issue of last resort and must not, in fact, deflect us from our major task of making sure that we put less CO2 into the air and where it is there that we, we, we look, in fact, to sequestrate it. And one last question. As we have discussed before, when you look at the major problems facing our world and globe, whether it's uh, climate change, whether it's energy uh, sustainability or energy independence or, or just sustainability of the planet, um, I think we're going to need cooperation uh, with multinational efforts, both intellectually and financially. Uh, and I wanted to get your thoughts uh, again, in the future, what additional topics might be taken up? I know you had talked about uh, synthetic biolo biology at one time. Uh, any other suggestions on those type of global issues that we might work, work on in the future? Well, Mr. Chairman, um, I think there is no doubt that the great challenges um, are, are not challenges simply for the United States or the United Kingdom um, or indeed for China or India, the emerging economies. They are global challenges, the great cha challenges of uh, water security, food security, energy, um, as well, of course, as issues like terrorism and other matters, all of which science has a major role to play, uh, require global uh, solutions. And, and I think that there is a, there is a, a fairly exhaustive uh, list. I mean, for instance, the whole issue of the oceans. 
Um, uh, I can remember being in the United States not long ago uh, uh, at Woods Hole, you know, looking at the, 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 the effect of the oceans on, on climate. And I think that that's an area for international and global co cooperation. Uh, the issue of space and, and the use of space, uh, again, requires global uh, activities. You and I talked when you were last in London about the whole issue of nanotechnologies. Uh, the way in which nanotechnologies are going to need very, very careful uh, global cooperation if, in fact, we're going to make most use, make most use of those technologies. Uh, the issue of sustainable agriculture. Uh, there is no way by 2050 we're going to be able to feed uh, the world's population given current agrarian uh, policies. Uh, and therefore, the need for international cooperation there um, is, is enormous. And if I might finally say, um, both your economy and our economy in the, in the UK have suffered massively because of the, uh, of the economic downturn. And if, if there is one area uh, where there is a need for far greater cooperation, certainly between our two nations in terms of, if you like, the social science um, of economics, uh, my goodness, that is one area we ought to look at. Thank you, Chairman. Um, my time has expired. In the United States, we have Americans and we have Texas Americans. And now I recognize um, my ranking member and good friend uh, from Texas, Mr. Uh, Hall. And being from Texas, we're happy to have international discussions from time to time. And about 10 or 15 years ago, we had a similar discussion on asteroids here, urging England, Germany, France, and others to come together to share the cost of tracing and tracking. And uh, it didn't work out because uh, I guess there was not enough fear. But we learned during that time that an asteroid missed the Earth only about 15 minutes, I think, in 1986 or 88. So there is a lot to learn together. And I admire the chairman for making a trip over there. His trip there spawned this historical meeting where you come before us, Chairman Willis, to testify. I've enjoyed hearing your testimony. I'll ask you just a question or so. It's kind of question as I know how to uh, act uh, when I don't really, I'm not terribly enthusiastic about this, but I'm excited about your appearance here and, and the chairman's vision. Uh, um, as you may have noticed from my newspapers, public opinion in the concept of geoengineering here in the United States covers the whole spectrum. It just goes everywhere here. Uh, did you find yourself in a similar situation in England initially? Well, well, Senator Hall, welcome to you, and it's, it's good to, uh, to talk to you. Or is it Mr. Hall I, I should officially address you as? Uh, but um, th there is no doubt that uh, when we uh, did, and we did, a, as I said, a piece of uh, investigation about geoengineering some uh, 18 months ago as part of a bigger inquiry, uh, there were many people, in particular some of the green NGOs, uh, non-government organizations who contacted us to say that this was really a distraction. It was distracting us from the main issue, which was about uh, climate change, which was about removing uh, CO2, and which was about sort of stopping the, the temperature of the Earth uh, rising. Um, and it's interesting that that has slightly changed. Uh, and there is now an acceptance that this is a long-term technology, is something which clearly needs to be put into the basket of tricks. But, but equally, it is important that it does not, in fact, uh, actually take uh, UK pounds, uh, and in your case, U US dollars, away from the main, uh, the main thrust, which is about creating sort of green technologies for transport, you know, for energy, and indeed making sure that we don't continue to create the problem. Uh, but I can tell you, Mr. Hall, that there are a significant number of people in the United Kingdom who actually regard this as a rather strange set of technologies and ones that, quite frankly, we have better things to spend our time on. Did you start with public hearings? How did you initiate it? Did you start with public hearings to discuss the issue? Well, we, what, what we do with all our in, in, inquiries is uh, we announce a set of terms of uh, reference for our inquiry, and of course we engage the public immediately at that time. Um, we then uh, try to seek out uh, witnesses, as you did, including Professor Shepard, uh, from across the globe in order to be able to feed um, into us, into, into our inquiry. 
um, and then to assemble a, a report and make a number of, uh, of key recommendations, including, of course, uh, in interviewing the government, the government ministers, to see what government policy is. And, of course, we did not have any government policy in this particular area because government did not have a policy towards geoengineering. And it's interesting that, that uh, whilst they still don't have a major commitment to uh, geoengineering as a, a mitigation uh, technology, nevertheless, the government have, uh, I think to their credit, actually engage with the science and to at least examine whether the science is, uh, if, uh, could be effective and predictable. I thank you for that. And I'm near the end of my uh, inquiry. I appreciate you being here. It is historic. I know his uh, trip over there visiting with you spawned this meeting, and I think it's very helpful. Uh, perhaps uh, we can uh, reciprocate with you somewhere down the line. Thank you, sir, and I yield back my time. Ms. Fudge is recognized, or, or, or Governor Giamandi is, is recognized for five minutes. The inquiry, uh, the information from the United Kingdom is excellent, and uh, I don't have any question right now. Thank you. And I see Ms. Dalkemper, and Ms. Dalkemper is recognized. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, this is very interesting and I, um, hearing, and I certainly uh, appreciate the Chairman being here with us today, but I also do not have any questions at this time. I'm sure as we go forward uh, with this cooperation, we'll have many more questions. So thank you, and I yield back. Well, Chairman Willis, as I said earlier, we are on the, the uh, precipice of uh, votes here. Uh, we received your report uh, last night. Uh, we've been in constant contact with your staff and been very pleased with that. We are going to digest that now, and uh, hopefully we will have a chance to be uh, back in touch with you. But we want to thank you for the, uh, the excellent body of work that you have presented us with. Uh, thank you indeed, uh, uh, Mr. Gordon, and it's been a pleasure not only to present to your committee today, but on the two opportunities we've been able to meet over the past uh, year, uh, you have treated us with huge courtesy, and we hope that this will be the sign of things to come, uh, certainly after our general election uh, here in May. Thank you, and we're going to move to a second panel of which we're going to keep you tuned in, and so if you would like to continue to hear that, you are welcome to, until, uh, again, we are required to leave for votes. And so I would ask the second panel to, to come forward, and we'll see. Uh, we're now told it's going to be about 1 o'clock before the votes get started. So. Okay, so we're ready now for our second panel. It's my pleasure to introduce uh, our witnesses. First, Dr. Frank Rusco is the Director of Natural Resource and Environment at the Government Accounting Office, GAO. Dr. Scott Barrett is the Linfest Professor of Natural Resource Economics in the School of International and Public Affairs and the Earth Institute at Columbia University. Dr. James Long is the Principal Associate Director at Large at Lawrence Rivermore National Lab. And Dr. Um, uh, Granger Morgan is professor and head of the Department of Engineering and Political Policy, as well as the Lord Professor uh, or Lord Chair Professor in the Engineering at the Carnegie uh, Mellon University. As witnesses should know, we have five, you have five minutes for your spoken testimony. Your written testimony has been included in the record. 
And when you complete your spoken testimony, we will then have questions. Each member will have five minutes to ask those questions. So, Dr. Rusco, we will begin with you. Thank you, Chairman Gordon, Ranking Member Hall, and members of the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to speak before you today on the important issue of domestic and international governance of geoengineering. Geoengineering has recently become an area of intensified interest, in part because of challenges in reaching international agreement to limit the growth of and eventually reduce global greenhouse gas emissions. In this context, if severe or relatively sudden climate change occurs at some future date, attempts to reverse or slow such trends through deployment of geoengineering technologies, either by reflecting some of the sun's rays that help heat the earth or by removing and sequestering ambient carbon dioxide may become relatively more attractive, especially in nations or regions that are particularly vulnerable to the effects of climate change. Three facts point to the importance of getting in front of the issue of domestic and international governance of geoengineering research and deployment. First, the severity of the effects of large-scale geoengineering effects efforts are uncertain and would likely be distributed unevenly, potentially creating relative winners and losers. As a result of the unknown severity and potential unevenness of outcomes, geoengineering research or deployment at a scale large enough to actually influence the global climate would carry with it the potential to be economically and politically destabilizing. Second, climate change modeling exercises <clears throat> or small-scale physical experiments for certain geoengineering approaches, such as stratospheric aerosol injection, may be inadequate to assess the efficacy or extent and distribution of unintended effects of geoengineering deployed at full scale. Put simply, to adequately assess the efficacy and distribution of effects of geoengineering, it may be necessary to actually deploy these technologies on a large scale and for a long period of time. Research on this scale would itself have uncertain and likely uneven effects around the globe, would potentially create winners and losers, and could lead to conflict over how to mitigate or adapt to any adverse effects. Third, some geoengineering technologies could be implemented at low enough cost that they could be undertaken by nations or other actors unilaterally or in coalitions. Simply put, if a nation or group perceives it in their interest to deploy such a technology that will have global but uncertain and unevenly distributed effects, it may well be possible for them to do so without broad international consensus or assistance. In our ongoing work in this area, we have found that some federal agencies have funded research and small demonstration projects of technology related to geoengineering. However, federal agencies have not been directed to, nor does there exist a coordinated federal geoengineering research strategy. Further, some existing federal laws could apply to geoengineering research and deployment. However, some federal agencies have not yet assessed their authority to regulate geoengineering, and those agencies that have done so have identified regulatory gaps. For example, under the Marine Protection, Research, and Sanctuaries Act of 1972, certain persons would be prohibited from dumping material for ocean fertilization into the ocean without a permit from EPA. EPA officials told us that the law's ocean dumping permitting process is sufficient to regulate certain ocean fertilization activities. However, they noted a domestic company could conduct ocean fertilization outside of EPA's regulatory jurisdiction if, for example, the company's fertilization activities took place outside U.S. territorial waters from a foreign registered ship that embarked from a foreign port. With regard to international governance, legal experts we spoke with identified a number of existing international agreements that are potentially relevant to specific geoengineering technologies. However, these agreements were not drafted with geoengineering in mind, and the signatories and parties to these agreements have typically not determined whether and how they apply to geoengineering. Further, these agreements have generally not been signed by all countries, nor have all signatories ratified or acceded to the agreements, thereby giving them the force of international law. While GAO cannot advise Congress at this time on specific needs for domestic or international governance of geoengineering research or deployment, we found broad consensus among both legal and science experts we spoke with that any geoengineering research of a large enough scale to have transboundary effects should be addressed in a transparent and international manner. However, there was a variety of views on the precise structure of such regulation or governance. 
For example, scientific experts recommended that research governance be established in consultation with the scientific community in order to not unduly restrict research. Similarly, we found a broad consensus that additional geoengineering research is warranted, but no consensus on the desirable extent of such research. We look forward to continuing our work in this area for the committee and hope to be able to make specific recommendations for federal actions in future reports. Mr. Chairman, this concludes my statement. I would be happy to answer any questions you or the committee may have. Thank you, Dr. Rusko. And Dr. Morgan is recognized. Uh, Mr. Chairman, distinguished members, thank you for the opportunity to appear today to discuss issues related to research and governance in geoengineering. I'm Granger Morgan, head of the Department of Engineering and Public Policy at Carnegie Mellon University. Our department is the home of a large National Science Foundation-supported distributed center on climate decision research. Some of our center's research has addressed the subject of solar radiation management, or SRM, uh, that would involve adding fine reflective particles to the stratosphere. We've also supported research on technology for directly scrubbing carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. As part of our work on SRM, we've organized and run two workshops to engage leading climate scientists and foreign policy experts in discussions of the issues of global governance of SRM, and we've published a paper on this topic in the journal Foreign Affairs that I've appended to my written testimony. I want to emphasize that I'm not arguing that the U.S. or anybody else should engage in SRM. The U.S. and other large emitting countries need to get much more serious about reducing emissions and lowering the concentration of atmospheric carbon dioxide. I believe that can be done at an affordable cost. However, we also need to understand, to undertake, a serious program of research on SRM. In a piece attached to my written testimony, my colleagues and I argued in Nature this January that the risk of not understanding whether and how well SRM might work, what it would cost, and what its intended and unintended consequences might be are, to great, are today greater than the risks associated with undertaking such research. Initial research on SRM should be supported by the National Science Foundation at a level of a few million dollars per year. NSF should be the initial funding agency for two reasons. One, NSF does a good job of supporting open, investigator-initiated research, and we need a lot of bright people thinking about this topic from different perspectives before developing any serious programs of field studies. Two, in addition to natural science and engineering, NSF supports research in the social and behavioral sciences, and those perspectives on this subject are urgently needed. However, We'll not be able to learn everything we need to learn with laboratory and computer studies. And once it's clear what sorts of field studies are needed, then NASA and or NOAA should become involved. I believe that DOE should stay focused on the problems of decarbonizing the energy system and reducing atmospheric concentrations of carbon dioxide. All research on SRM should be open and transparent. Hence, SRM research should not be undertaken by DOD or the intelligence communities. Private for-profit funding of SRM research should be actively discouraged since it holds the potential to create a special interest that might push to move beyond research into deployment. I turn now to the global governance of SRM research. I believe that there should be no constraints on modest, low-level field studies done in an open and transparent manner designed to better understand what is and what is not possible, what it might cost, and what possible unintended consequences might result. That said, I think it likely that pressure will grow for some more formal international oversight of SRM, and for that reason I think one of the first objectives in a U.S. research program should be to give the phrase modest low-level field testing a more precise definition. My first slide uh, shows one way to frame this issue. In that diagram, X, Y, and Z define the limits of an allowed zone. They refer respectively to the upper bounds on the amount of radiative forcing that an experiment might impose, the duration of that forcing, and the possible impacts on ozone depletion. As my second slide shows, early research should ask what should the allowed zone, how should the allowed zone be defined, uh, with, and should it use different axes? 
what should be the shape of that zone, what should be the values of X, Y, Z, and so on, and then in joint discussion with foreign policy experts, what forms of international agreement and enforcement, if any, would be most appropriate and what scientific input would they require. Now, all my remarks have focused on SRM. There are a number of technologies for directly scrubbing carbon dioxide out of the Earth's atmosphere and sequestering it deep underground. These are very important. The Department of Energy should support research to develop and test such technologies starting at a level of several tens of millions of dollars per year. Research and development by private for-profit firms in this area should be very actively encouraged. Mr. Chairman, thank you. Thank you. And uh, Dr. Long is recognized. And we need to use your, there we go. Thank you. Okay, I hope the timer starts now. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, thank you for this opportunity to talk to you. My name is Jane Long. I'm a Principal Associate Director at large at Lawrence Livermore, and I am currently acting as the co-chair of the National uh, Commission on Energy Policies Task Force on Geoengineering. Today my comments rec uh, represent my own views and uh, not the views of either my laboratory or the NSEP uh, task force, which has just uh, begun its work. I'm going to talk about geoengineering, about uh, three classes of geoengineering that uh, were identified by the American Meteorological Society. Climate remediation, taking carbon dioxide out of the air. Climate intervention, which is an actual act to change the nature of the climate. And uh, the third category, which is a catch-all category. Most of my remarks will focus on the second category because you're interested in governance, and this is where the governance issues largely occur. My only remark about uh, the uh, category of, of climate remediation in my oral remarks today would be that uh, there are fewer governance issues associated with it, that the research, as Dr. Morgan has pointed out, falls closely allied to CCS, carbon capture and storage research, currently being uh, pursued by the Department of Energy, and that this program should be expanded to, uh, uh, to include this. From a governance perspective, uh, there is a question about whether the technology should be a public good or we should tap into the forces of the market, and I think that that question uh, depends on whether we end up having a price for carbon. If we have a price for carbon, this technology could easily be uh, innovated in the private sector. If not, it's more like picking up the garbage and should be a public good. Let me turn my attention now to um, climate intervention. I really endorse the, com uh, the UK principles that were heard this morning. I think they're extremely important. And I, I would like to uh, uh, endorse those and say that uh, those are at the top of my list. First of all, I think that the climate, climate technology should be a public good and that we should say up front that we are not planning for deployment. If we, if we uh, start our research program by saying we're planning for deployment, it will put a lot of pressure and a lot of pushback on whether people are against it. A lot of people who are against the idea of geoengineering are clearly for research and we should not convolve those at this point. There are four questions that we need to get after in a national research governance uh, format. One is what, a, what constitutes an appropriate level of governance for specific types of research. The second is what are the guiding principles and values that should be used to sanction the research. And then given these principles, what process should be used to, to uh, sanction the research. And then how will the governance proce engage, process engage society. Granger has, Dr. Morgan has presented a, uh, a concept for determining that level of research which should proceed with what I'll call only normal governance. I endorse that and recommend that you convene a National Academy of Science panel now to help define what that bright line is below which research can proceed with impunity. This is critically important because we need to get started on research and a lot of research is not problematic and getting a definition of what we can go ahead with would be very important. Then we need to work on principles. I would like to add a few principles to those you heard this morning, um, and that is beneficence should be a principle. We should have, um, we heard transparency, we heard um, public good, we heard public partic participation, we heard independent assessment of impacts, and we heard governance before deployment. But I would like to add to that that we need to have some assessment that the risks of the project are, are not outweighed, are uh, 
sorry, that the benefits of the project, the potential benefits of the project clearly outweigh any risks that are there, and some aspect of justice, ensuring a reasonable, non-exploitive, well-considered procedures, and that the risks are fairly distributed. In the research program, I think that the justice um, perspective is one that should be quite clear. We should not be taking advantage of, pe of people or peoples in doing research, but beginning to ask the question in the research program will help us as we move towards possible deployment. The review process then has to go forward, and let me just make one clear point about that. We don't know how to govern this research and do the review, but we have other models. And what I would recommend now is that we start a program with mock governance and mock um, uh, uh, review boards that can try different principles and different procedures and see how they work, much as the institutional review boards for human subjects research tries uh, different, different ways to proceed and, and then assesses how, how well they have done. Thank you for the, uh, com for the opportunity to comment today, and I will, uh, the rest of my remarks are in my written testimony. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Long, and uh, Dr. Barrett's recognized. Thank you very much, Chairman Gordon, and thank you other members for this opportunity. Climate change is a real risk, and we have to do five things to limit that risk. First, we need to reduce global emissions of greenhouse gases. Second, we need to invest in research and development to develop new technologies that will allow us to reduce emissions at lower cost in the future. Third, we need to prepare to adapt and to assist poor, more vulnerable countries to adapt. Fourth, we need to develop technologies that can remove carbon dioxide directly from the atmosphere. And finally, we need to contemplate the possibility of using geoengineering, which I will define as being a technology that can address global warming without affecting the concentration of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. Solar radiation management might be a shorthand for what I just said. I think it's helpful to look at this problem from two different perspectives. One is from that of the perspective of the world as a whole, and the other is from the perspective of individual countries. So let's start with the perspective of the world as a whole. I think there are four different options for thinking about deployment of geoengineering. Uh, the first one would be we just ban it. And there are a lot of people, I think, their first instincts will be that we should ban it. But then you have to imagine going forward, suppose we're in a situation where we start to see the worst fears of abrupt and catastrophic climate change appearing. At that point, the only thing we could do that would have any impact, that would have an immediate impact, would be to use geoengineering. So I believe that a ban on geoengineering, although I understand the instinct, I believe it would not be a credible uh, policy or even a responsible policy. Second thing we could do would be to rely entirely on geoengineering, the kind of quick fix, the kind of easy way of, of uh, dealing with this problem. That would also be irresponsible because this is a risk problem and that would be putting all our eggs in one basket. Also, of course, the geoengineering that we're discussing won't address other uh, problems such as uh, ocean, fertil uh, ocean uh, acidification. Third thing we might do is we might start using geoengineering actually fairly soon in conjunction with, say, emission reductions or other policies. And the fourth thing that we might do would be to develop the technology and to keep it in reserve should the, should the moment arrive, arise in the, the future where we do face this scenario of abrupt and catastrophic climate change. I've looked at all four options. I think a case can be made for the last two. I think a case cannot be made for the first two. So let's look at this issue now from the perspective of individual countries. I think two scenarios are relevant. One is a scenario of gradual climate change. This is kind of the slow unfolding of climate change over time. And what we know about this scenario is that it produces winners and losers. Now the losers, and I've done some back of the envelope calculations, the losers may find it in their interest to want to use geoengineering to offset the effects of what I'll call global warming. The problem is that if that kind of climate change creates winners and losers, the use of geoengineering will also create winners and losers. So this is a situation in which there would be, I would say, international tensions and possibly conflict. I actually think, though, that when you have a situation like this, there are incentives there for the conflict to be resolved. And I'm going to come back to that a little bit later. I don't worry about geoengineering wars. The second scenario that I think is relevant would be abrupt and catastrophic climate change. And that scenario opinion around the world is going to be very uniform, uh, and a lot of countries are going to want to contemplate the use of this technology. So I think in that scenario, clearly, you don't have a problem of uh, international conflict. In both cases, though, I think we need to contemplate the development now of rules, because rules will reduce uncertainty, and uncertainty is something we want to do to manage these risks. 
And in particular, I think we need rules for the possible use of geoengineering as well as for research and development into uh, geoengineering. And the essential thing to understand about this is that we also need rules, we need arrangements, international arrangements to reduce emissions, but the incentives for countries to reduce emissions are individually are relatively modest, even though collectively we'd be much better off if all countries took action. So you have a colossal free riding problem. But geoengineering is exactly the opposite. It would be something a country could do on its own, and the costs, as we understand them today, are sufficiently low that it may be in, the, in a, one country's interest or a small coalition of countries' interest to actually use it. So on the, for the one issue, reducing emissions, you want to encourage countries to act. On the geoengineering, you want to do the opposite. You want to restrain countries from acting when that action would be opposed and may possibly harm other countries. Now, what kind of rules would we need to address uh, geoengineering? I can think of seven. Um, that would be relevant right now. The first is that we need to understand that geoengineering is only one of, as I said, five things we need to do to reduce the risks associated with climate change. And I think that geoengineering should be embodied within an agreement like the Framework Convention on Climate Change that can balance all those risks. Second, uh, we, should inc we should make that agreement open for all countries to participate since all countries would be affected. Third, the focus of the agreement should be on what countries can agree on and not what they cannot agree on. Fourth, um, the um, uh, should be a requirement that, that states de declare, announce that they will use geoengineering. So there should be prior uh, information about that. Fifth, there should be an obligation for countries to cooperate uh, to resolve any conflicts. And finally, on um, uh, that we should be seeking uh, sorry, we should be seeking a consensus. And then finally, on research and development, we should have transparency. And I would also encourage international collaboration. I think the, the final point though, to make is that we need not only to understand the technology, but also to build trust. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Barrett. I think the concept of trying to uh, find what we can agree upon is unfortunately unusual around here. We spend too much time on what we can't agree upon. Uh, I thank all of our witnesses for their testimony. I understand that Dr. Barrett and Dr. Long are co-chairs of the Bipartisan Policy Center's initiative. Um, really. You and we are all part of a pioneering effort here, and uh, we – yes, ma'am. Oh, is that – oh, well, okay. Uh, so we, we look forward to your additional information as this, again, body of evidence in, in this early pioneering effort. And I'm, now I'm going to yield to Mr. Or Governor Jeremondi um, for any question he might have. Uh, thank you very much. Um, uh, Dr. Barrett, uh, your rules are a great place to start. What we need is some form in which to begin the discussion in setting out the rules of the game. I, and I really urge just, uh, this committee and uh, Congress and anybody else to try to figure out what that form would be to set that down. Do you have a suggestion on how that might be accomplished? Well, you mean a process? You mean a process? A process. Initiate discussion. Uh, you know, it's, it's a great question. And right now, you know, in the, in the, in the follow-up to Copenhagen, there's been a lot of discussion about that process and whether that process is the problem. And I actually don't think the process, the UN process, is the problem. I think it's our approach to climate change that has been the problem. So I think the diagnosis is very important. I think on this issue, because all countries have a stake in the issue, and I think this is an issue that people need some time to think about. You know, our, f our first reactions to this issue are not the same as our reactions as we think about it more. So I think the natural place in which there should be a beginning of a discussion would be under the Framework Convention on Climate Change. I think that agreement needs to be revised to address this fundamental problem of reducing risk. And I think once we look at this as a problem of reducing risk, we will want to, um, you know, include under that agreement a lot of different issues, including geoengineering. I don't have time with my questions to go to each one of you about that, but I think that's really a central piece of where, where we need to go as a committee is to, okay, what's the next step? What's the process for that? I, I, I'm going to – I'd like to go to Dr. Long uh, for a couple of reasons. One, we've had wonderful discussions about this over the years, and you're from my district. So <laughs> the other three, please excuse me. Um, and, and this really speaks to uh, Dr. Morgan's point that the Department of Energy should not have a role here. I, I disagree with that, and I'd like Dr. Long to, uh, to really talk to this issue. It turns out that the, uh, the, the, the laboratories, the energy, Department of Energy labs, have a very, I think, Ill, a wrongly defined mission at the moment, which is nuclear security. Mm -hmm. 
And I think they have to have a change in their mission statement to one of national security where all of the resources at those labs can be used to deal with a broader range of national security issues beyond bombs. Um, for example, the biggest and perhaps the best computer to deal with climate modeling is at Lawrence Livermore National Laboratories. Sometimes uh, Alamos will dispute that and others will dispute it, but the labs do have extraordinary uh, computing capability, which is central to this issue. Uh, and also a lot of uh, knowledge about things that go boom. Uh, for example, if you want to seed the atmosphere with sulfates, you're probably going to use something that goes boom. Anyway, these kinds of things are there, and I would just recommend that. So, Dr. Long, if you could speak about the assets that are at the laboratories in the context of dealing with this issue. Well, I think one of the one of the most important things that I uh, is in my written testimony. And I didn't get a chance to talk about is the need for adaptive management in this in this problem, and to do adaptive management, we are going to have to be able to predict. We're going to have to make a prediction about the results of our actions, and then we're going to have to be able to discern whether that prediction is correct by making observations. And then we're going to have to decide whether we're going in the right direction and change direction if we're not. There are many things that are required to do that. One of them is computing, and one of them is simulation of the climate. The, the laboratory conducts currently a program called PCMDI, which is Program and Model Comparison for, for Climate. These kinds of studies, very careful, even-handed assessments of whether the climate is, is changing in response to the actions we are taking or it's just climate variability that we're seeing, are going to be critical. And these kinds of calculations are very demanding and can be done uh, at national laboratories. It also, this, this problem, though, also relates to something that Dr. Barrett said. Somewhere in here we have to engage with the public and with the policymakers at the same time that this kind of analysis is coming in because the hardest piece is, it's hard as it is to make a decision to take an action, we're also going to have to make decisions to change the direction of our action. And that is going to have to be supported hand in hand with really good analysis and fingerprinting of what we're actually doing. And that exists at the national laboratories. Dr. Morgan, you wanted to jump. You've got a few <laughs> seconds to do so. Yeah. One activity that's going forward, the Royal Society, as we heard in the first session, has just uh, undertaken something called the Solar Radiation Management Governance Initiative, which uh, will be undertaken by the Royal Society, by the societies, the, the science societies of the developing world, uh, by Environmental Defense, the, the NGO, and a number of other organizations, including, for example, the International Risk Governance Council, whose uh, uh, Scientific and Technical Council I chair and which uh, convened one of the two workshops that I mentioned. So, so that's a process, an international process that's ongoing. I would argue that one does not want to get too firm a restriction in place on small-scale studies early on because it'll tie the science hands. Um, well, you're very quick on when the red light came on, right in the middle of the sentence. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I don't know if the chairman is that strict. Could you finish your sentence? No, I would simply suggest, I mean, the reason I showed that slide with the funny box was to simply say, I think what the science community ought to be trying to do is say, you do small-scale stuff inside this space. And it's a scientific question what that space ought to be. There shouldn't be a lot of oversight and restriction. If you put too much UN approval and other stuff in place, we're never going to get any answers. And so we've got to find a space that's safe and appropriate to do studies and then say, outside that, that's forbidden until, you know, there's some larger governance structure in place. Mr. Chairman, I'm going to take another 30 seconds, if I might, and, and just compliment you on this meeting and really urge you and your committee uh, staff and, and the rest of us to really hone in on this issue. I'm very taken by the issue of, of setting the rules, whatever those might be, and, and the caution that was given, and also the full utilization of all of our research capabilities here in the United States and around the world in some sort of a coordinated effort. Uh, it's really, really important in my mind, and I thank you for the hearing. Thank you, Governor. Uh, the lights are automatic, but folks have made a lot of effort to get here and participate, so we, we try to be um, generous with our time. Mr. Hall is recognized. 
Mr. Chairman, I only want to uh, ask uh, unanimous consent to do something here if I can find it. Uh, I want a, a paper that was published in the Journal of Petroleum Science and Engineering by the Economides couple. I'd like unanimous consent to place that journal article into the record. Without objection. I yield back my time, sir. Uh, Mr. Dr. Baird is recognized. I thank the chair. I thank our witnesses. I, I find this one of the most fascinating things we're dealing with because you've got uh, as consequential a situation as you can imagine and a system more complex than, than anything else on Earth because it is Earth and lots of unintended consequence risks. You know, just last week, I think, or this week, an article about the fertilization of the oceans leading to excessive uh, uh, algae bloom, presumably, and domic acid. And the, the, the question here is we are doing geoengineering. It's called the CO2 we're putting in the atmosphere and, and methane, et cetera. And, and now we're trying to sort of put that genie back in the bottle. I, I, let's suppose I'm the Maldive Islands. And I quite fairly and realistically assume that the likelihood of the industrialized world actually cutting CO2 emissions in a reasonable time is grim. And it's existential for us. And I'm going to just do some SRM on our own. Uh, can't hardly fault them. We've done the geoengineering in the other direction on our own. What's to prevent that? Or even in a James Bond scenario, some rogue rich guy puts some airplanes in the air and sees the clouds. What is to prevent that? Dr. Morgan or Dr. Rusko, you talked about this. Uh, nothing to prevent somebody initiating it, but the U.S. Navy can stop the Maldives. <laughs> the U.S. Navy can't stop, you know, Russia if it decides that the... Uh, uh, the whole interior of the country has become an impermeable bog because of the thawing of permafrost. China, because precipitation patterns have changed uh, and they can't feed their people anymore. And so one of the reasons that, that we initiated this uh, uh, workshop at the Council on Foreign Relations a couple of years ago was precisely to begin to address the issue of unilateral action of the sort you describe. Uh, and I think it remains a serious uh, concern. There's disagreement within the foreign policy community about just how uh, big a concern unilateral activity might be, but the notion that one or a couple of major states might decide to do it, I think, uh, uh, is uh, quite troubling and, given the right circumstances, might be very hard to do much about. We have a new variation of mutually assured destruction here in some ways. Yeah, Dr. Barrett. Uh, it is a great question. I, I think... Uh, uh, the point, and actually, there's a scenario I developed in my written testimony about India. I, I think it's much more likely to be the country to use it. Uh, it's only hypothetical, but still, it's, it's a very plausible. Given the impact on their population yes, and, the, and the migration that would be forced by it, sure. Yes, indeed. And uh, But other countries, again, for that scenario of gradual climate change, if India had the incentive to want to use geoengineering, other countries would be adversely affected. They, of course, would oppose that move. And you can imagine, first, it would be uh, opposition would be voiced, then other measures might be taken, there might be development of counter geoengineering measures, uh, and also there could be a military strike, but it's precisely because of that actually, I think what you're looking for, and I think what we want in the, in the form of uh, what I call rules, or in terms of a kind of regime on geoengineering, is a space in which countries can actually negotiate through their differences. And I think there will be strong incentives to do that. The countries that are the most capable to act on geoengineering are all nuclear capable states. And I think uh, the most important thing is that we don't let this whole system rip, but we create the space for negotiation. I'd like to add to that that I think that the research program can help to mitigate this situation. The thing that we need to focus on is the creation of international norms and mores that support the same ethical constructs when it comes to deploying geoengineering. And by building that in to an international research program and beginning to practice um, uh, that, those kinds of relationships and norm building uh, exercises through the research program, I think we can help to mitigate that situation. I would really encourage this panel and my colleagues from the other side of the aisle to I think there, it's an urgent need for a constructive dialogue with my friends on the other side of the aisle on this because we spend an inordinate amount of time here on this committee, unfortunately, uh, debating whether or not this is, is real and the, as if 
the outcome of our debate will somehow impact what happens in the real world. By that I mean as if climate change is going to be stopped if we declare it's not happening. But I think the adverse consequences that you're describing, and the, the profound geopolitical, national security, economic disruption, if you get your bet wrong, really has to be discussed. Because if we're, if we're at this level of discussion, and when you talk about India, the migratory disruption of, co of coastal sea rise is astonishing and how that affects everything else. We really have to in engage my friends on the other side who have a good and healthy, decent respect for national security and economic issues to consider this aspect. And, and we haven't done it enough. And I would, I would invite them to discuss with you folks these implications. Because if we just say, well, we're not going to do anything because climate change is a hoax, as is sometimes said by colleagues, that hoax can have some darn serious consequences if it's not a hoax. And we just need to, to speak in the language that my friends on the Republican side I think will appreciate in terms of national security, et cetera. And so I hope, I'm sorry they're not here, but I think it's a, a, an avenue that we ought to explore more. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for calling this hearing. Thank you, Dr. Bay. We'll be sure to have metal detectors when we get ready to do that, um, that discussion. Uh, uh, let me conclude here, unless, unless Mr. Hall has some additional suggestions. Uh, there had been discussion about federal research. Could I would ask the panel in general what different agencies would be the appropriate, what agency or agencies would be the appropriate uh, vehicles for this type of research? And we'll just start and go down. Thank you. We're, we're in the process of, of uh, engaging all the agencies that might have a, a role to play in this, and, and we'll be reporting on that soon to the committee. Um, so would this be something like the National Nanotechnology Technology Initiative, where there would be a coordinated uh, effort across a variety of different agencies? I think that, that our past work points to a need for a coordinated effort on anything of this magnitude. Uh, there, there, you want to avoid... Um, unnecessary du duplicative uh, activities, but you also want to uh, utilize all the, the, the many resources and, and, and um, assets that the, that the federal agencies bring to, the, to this sort of an effort. And so a coordinated effort uh, that, that looks at the costs and benefits of, of, of a national strategy for, for looking at this sort of research is what's needed. We're being called for votes, so let me just ask I would assume everyone concurs with that unless you have a suggestion of something specific other, otherwise. Is there anyone that? Some y yes, Dr. Long. Conditions. Um, in remediation, in the remediation side, we already, as I mentioned, we already run a CCS program that could be easily expanded. Uh, EPA should probably be involved in that. On the intervention technologies, many of them are related strongly to climate science program, and, and, and much of it, particularly the uh, observation network, um, and the ability to predict what's going to happen when you take an intervention. That's as an expansion of, uh, of climate science, DOE, NOAA, NASA, NSF are all involved and uh, should be probably involved again. And my testimony speaks specifically to your question, so I won't elaborate. Dr. Barrett? Yeah, just briefly. First, I would not have the Department of Defense do it. And second, I would encourage international collaboration. And you want to elaborate on why you would not have the Department of Defense participate? I think this issue of trust that I ended my testimony on is extremely important. And I think the moment that, uh, you know, and if our Defense Department can be involved, and so can other countries, and I think there's already enough distrust uh, on a number of issues, including, for example, space involving different countries, I think it would be much better to keep this as, as an issue that's addressing just the one threat of climate change. And Both of the international workshops we ran reached much that same conclusion. And, and I would take it one step further, which is to say that our national program should explicitly look at research that would enhance the global welfare um, rather than the national welfare. Mr. Chairman? Dr. Uh, Baird, recognize. Would you not, however, think it's beneficial for the Department of Defense to at least inform the debate of, by this body about the consequences if we fail to address this? Well, they may not be involved in the structure in the global regulatory environment, but they certainly ought to be involved in, in, in gaming out the consequences for their, their responsibilities. Would that make sense? I think they already are in terms of what would happen in terms of migration of peoples and that sort of thing. They and certainly are. I just, I, it's yeah. that I mean, point you, I made earlier. I want to give some to, credibility. Yeah. 
Well, uh, as I said, our, we, our votes are on their way right now, so uh, let me thank all of our witnesses for uh, being here today. The record will remain open for two weeks for additional statements from members and for answers to any follow-up questions that the committee may ask the witnesses. Once again, uh, uh, I appreciate you giving your information to this pioneering body of information uh, that I think will be beneficial for generations to come. And this um, hearing is concluded, and the witnesses are excused.